It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Um, so let's kick off our conversation. Sounds here's, good. Here's my first question for you. How do you define uh, quality care? Yeah. So <clears throat> I have been at the, re I, I was at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago for about 15 years before I became the CEO. And that organization was 50 years in running the best in the nation uh, by every metric that existed, uh, US News and World Report, Magnet, um, also uh, NIH funding. And when I became a CEO, patients started to talk to me differently. And so here we thought we were the best at rehabilitation. And I've been treating patients there. And they started to come to tell me it wasn't good enough. And that while they were happy with the experience, and they felt as though their doctors and their clinicians and the nurses and all treated them very well and they were ready to move on into, into society with whatever it is they were there for. And particularly this was a child who came in with his parents. They asked me, one, one parent asked me if they could sign up to be on the list. And I said, the list, what, what list? And they sat next to me and they said, well, the list that you must have that when you find the cure, you're gonna call Johnny back and we're gonna get that cure, which is what we seek. And we're, we're waiting for that. And I said, oh. Now, very concretely, we didn't have a list. I don't know if any organization has a list like that. But they were, they were really serious about that. And I said, oh, you know, we don't have a list. And all of a sudden, I walked right into something that was overwhelmingly sad and um, just uh, devastating to that family. They said, what do you mean if you, don't, if you don't have a list, then no one will have a list. You're the best that there is in the country. You need a list, and we want to be on it. So metaphorically, that actually moved me. And I had other patients as the CEO tell me similar things that they didn't tell me as an attending physician. They told me about their hopes, their desires, their dreams about outcomes. And so it was at that point in time, it was about a year after I became the CEO, when I, when I sort of had an epiphany about we, we needed new space, we were in high demand, we had no place to grow, and um, that's not a good formula for the future. So I got our team together without a consultant, our scientists, our clinicians, our managers, key doctors. And I threw up the word rehabilitation on the uh, on the screen, on the, on the blackboard, and I said, is this what we're all about? Now, now mind you, this is a 50-year organization, best of its breed and kind, and they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> like, we're the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. And I said, no, really, is that what we're about? Like, do we, do we feel great if we design a great process that patients feel good about, but they come in with certain impairments and they leave with exactly the same thing, even though they felt good about the process. And even if we had a metric, let's say this pin, was the metric that could define that with irrefutably that was the best process of rehabilitation in the world. Does that make us feel good? And the whole room of my colleagues and professionals, PhDs, MDs, just stopped. And I said, rehabilitation is a process, which is what most healthcare metrics are these days for quality. I said, we've got to go to that quality outcome. What is that? What is that in our field? And we chose the word ability 11 years ago before anybody was using it because it was a, it was a favorable nod on disability. It was a code word for outcome, which was too sterile. It was a code word for recovery, and it was really even a code word for cure. Without, when people say we're going to cure this, you know, they mean you know, they, they think that they're going to come in, I'm going to touch you, and they'll be cured. Cure is, cure is, you know, takes time. So we chose the word ability, and it's hard to define because it's individual for every single patient. For every single one of us, we have our definition of what that means. And we'd be willing to trade off a little bit of a lot of things in order to get what, what that ability is. And so that's what our journey started around building a new building, focused not on the process, but on the outcome, which we, co we called ability. Now, I will say also, Anne, what was interesting for me is I didn't need to write a big slogan or a big vision campaign because everybody in the room got it. 
and they all knew that day, 10 years before the building was built, that how they could contribute to ability and, develop, and, and the application, or if you will, the development of ability right then. And they, they went off running toward it in all of their various areas. So it was that one day, that one word that really changed the folks, the organization, and we ran toward it. If folks haven't seen it, I have to say this is an obsession of many designers across IDEO. The Ability Lab comes up all the time <laughs> as, as somewhere that feels so different and so inspiring in, 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 in a space that can be quite the opposite sometimes. Yeah, so that's right. So if you haven't, after this is done, go Google it and go look at the images. <laughs> We did change the name, by the way. It's no longer Rehabilitation Institute. So tell me, tell me about your experience, particularly with what you've done at Newton Wellesley Hospital yep. and how that's been game changing for that organization. Yeah, so when I think about the word quality, when we went on, uh, so at IDEO, we bring a human centered um, approach to problem solving. One of the biggest spaces that we work in is actually health and healthcare. Um, and on this project, we had gone on this journey together with the president of the hospital, and he had said, you know, I want to transform the culture of this hospital to be much more innovative. I feel like my staff is not empowered. I can tell them this, but they, they won't necessarily go out and do it. So that was really the brief. And, and that to ladder up to then to be a world-class community hospital. And um, we, in going out and doing the research, one of the things that we actually very quickly landed on was what quality meant to people. And... Um, this was actually really eye-opening for clinicians because the clinicians there, and this is also nested in a very large academic medical uh, environment, was quality meant top-notch medical care and, and um, the best outcomes possible. And what we heard from patients, actually, is that for them, quality meant, um, there's actually, kind of, and granted, we're in New England, we're in a little bit of a different situation in terms of the saturation of healthcare options, but that there was sort of an assumed quality of care, but that quality actually came through the quality of the experience. And so the anchor moments with clinicians, be they positive or in, in often also negative, ne negative experiences, that actually became anchors for them as they were thinking about quality. And so as they would go about looking for care, um, you know, it was, it was interesting. Some of the physicians' attitudes were, well, people are going to come here because it's the best. And so they will wait out. It doesn't really matter what the experience is. Whereas on the flip side, what we were hearing from people was, no, actually, that is, that is one of the primary things for us is we're going out and trying to to be healed, that, that that relational aspect was something that was so important. So it became an interesting thing in understanding, just, just dissecting that word quality. Um, and as we did the work with Newton Wellesley and worked around the hospital um, with different teams, that became really a focal point for how we actually created prototypes. One of the first places we worked in was actually the Women's Imaging Center there. And this is a, this is a you know, they, they have top-notch radiologists, great technicians, and they all sort of felt like, okay, we're, we are, we're, we're also, you know, very patient-centered, as in we, you know, we really think a lot about the patient. And through the experience of prototyping and going out and doing the research, um, and also kind of funny story around that, it, it was very eye-opening to see it actually from the other side, from mm -hmm. the patient side, in a similar way that you had that moment. For us, we often use analogous experiences to help inspire people and help them understand um, sort of what the, uh, and create empathy and compassion for who we're designing for. And so we thought, okay, what's an interesting analogous experience around getting a mammogram, right? You go into this, you, you, you get squashed, you're, you wait. <laughs> um, there's a radiologist in a dark room sort of reading your future, what that could be, the worst fear being that you're diagnosed with cancer. And so we thought, you know what it is? Can anybody guess? Anybody want to take a stab? Tarot card reading. So we actually took the clinical team and we brought a tarot card reader in. We had all of them have their tarot cards read. And this was, you know, they were like, what is this? This is, this is a very odd experience. But um, you know, whether or not they believed in tarot card reading, the point was that here was somebody who was, who was interpreting mm -hmm. these cards that they were flipping over and then offering a glimpse into their future. And interestingly, there was actually one moment where one of the um, technicians um, you know, the tarot card reader said, actually, you know, what's blocking you is a relationship on the clinic on a with one of your colleagues. And um, you're at this point where you're either going to, you're going to stay or you're going to quit. And this, and uh, this woman was like, that's exactly how I'm feeling. And so there was actually, it created this whole unlock um, for the team around that. And that sort of led us down this path that in order to design for a better uh, patient experience, you actually need to design for a better um, caregiver experience, right, the, in, in care delivery. Uh, this was a team that was highly functional, 
But there were a lot of wedges there, and not just the distance between the radiologists and the technicians, but also you know, among the team. And if you look at, at sort of the, cult, the cultures within healthcare, that was getting in the way of them being able, being able to innovate and, and think of new ways to be able to deliver on that promise to patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, it's a creative way around getting to that patient experience, which ultimately should deliver a better outcome. When we were uh, designing, initiating the design of our new building, we had decided that um, the way we were going to create a better outcome for patients was through science. And rehabilitation tradi traditionally did not have a lot of science in it, but now it was like, it was exploding, just booming with science. If you think about um, smart materials and lightweight materials and uh, biologics and pharmacogenetics and genetic uh, materials and smart devices and all sorts of technology. And so we decided that we were gonna take all our researchers and put them right smack together, sort of to your point, in the center of the patient instead of the patient experience, instead of the patient care. So our researchers with our clinicians and the patients, they'd have to see patients every day, 24 seven. They'd have to walk into wherever they were and understand what those patients were struggling with and have to then inform their research about what was really relevant. And so the, um, I remember when we were ready to do the beauty contest with the, um, it was a big building, an expensive building. It turned out to be a $600 million building, all in, land and all. And we did the beauty contest with the um, architects. And we needed a few architects because we are a 26-story building. Downtown Chicago hospitals are usually flat. And um, so we needed um, uh, a build, uh, an architect that could design an urban, large-scale, um, vertical uh, building, but also then a healthcare expert who could design the insides relative to a hospital. And they all began with, we'd sit down and they'd say, okay, we're gonna start with the patient experience. <laughs> Every one of them, and I said, I don't wanna start with the patient experience, and their mouth drops, dropped. I said, you don't wanna start with the patient experience? I said, no. What patient wants to be in a, in a hospital? I mean, really? Is there anybody in the room? I mean, I might find one or two here in the room, but who really wants to be in a hospital? Nobody does. And so, I said, I want you to design to what we're defining as gonna help us with the patient outcome. So go back and think about it. And every single designer, every single architect had come to us, we're gonna, we're gonna design to the patient experience. I'm I don't want the patient experience first. If we design to better outcomes, we'll build in a patient experience that will ultimately meet the needs of the patients. And by the way, I, along the journey, I asked every single patient, would you trade off a little bit of comfort care, better food, a little bit of you know convenience of this X, Y, and Z. If you came in paralyzed and you were going to walk, 100%, no question about it. So we started with the outcome first, and we defined what we felt would create that outcome through science, technology, and the embeddedness of all the smart people, creating a big bed, if you will, that they were going to inform each other around what would make faster, uh, better, and ultimately more ingenious outcomes for patients. Do you know today, it was published in JAMA in 2007, that only 16% um, of all NIH-funded medical research ever gets to the clinical environment. It sits in the shelves of those big towers that are medical research buildings that are across the street from the hospital, if you're lucky, because they, don't, they, aren't, they aren't designed with relevance for the patient population. So think about what would happen if you would bring those populations together, the scientist with the clinician in the applied environment. And that's what we did. We designed the outcome first, then built in what you're talking about, which is that open communication, open um, you know, love of, uh, and respect for patient care and respect for each other. And uh, we're, we're two years into it now and having amazing, amazing results. Yeah, one thing I actually want to talk about with you is how you articulate what that outcome is. So yeah. you were just saying that it's not talking about it as outcomes, but it's ability. Yeah. And what's interesting is a parallel in thinking about just taking that uh, Women's Imaging Center as an, as an example, is that ultimately they wanna be able to screen and catch cancers early enough. Right. But the narrative that they're using now, and this is I think a really beautiful example of how the group there has been so empowered to bring design into what they're doing, 
is there, they, there's a sign actually. When you, when you now exit the, the mammography area, there's a sign that says, thank you for taking care of yourself today. And that was actually something that had come out of the prototyping. And this is something they're so incredibly proud of and that they've brought the branding team in on and they've created these different size posters and they have things that people can take home as a reminder, not only for themselves, but actually to spread the word and get their friends yeah. to come in as well. But I think recasting what that, what that goal is is incredibly important um, and thinking about it from more, almost a more narrative point of view, right. right? So in the absence of outcomes anywhere in the world, you go to cost. Think about if you had two cell phones, you had an Android and you had an iPhone, and there was really no measurable difference in how you used it or what outcome it gave you. You're going to go to the cheapest one. In the absence of outcomes in healthcare, you're going to dummy down to cost. And we're all chasing costs. Yeah. And that makes me crazy as a physician because we have very, very few, uh, very few medical processes that result in a real tangible outcome, a real defined outcome. And so, for example, one of the first things that we discovered, just putting tools that are around our researchers, like a functional MRI, we have this chronic pain clinic. By the way, pain is a $600 billion business, and it often emanates from functional and, and cognitive and behavioral issues. We have a chronic pain clinic. And one of our researchers, our model is our researchers and our physicians, we like to get them together to think about it. Because physicians, for the most part, aren't trained to be researchers. And so this one researcher said, hey, let's put the patients through the program, and let's put them in the functional MRI and just measure the, the weight of their brain. So they started with the, before the program, the weight of 20 brains, and then they ended, at the end of the program, the weight of 20 brains, and guess what? The brain grew. On every patient that had a positive outcome from the pain program, the brain normalized. It grew in the areas where the pain was identified on the functional MRI as being problematic. That's huge. That's never been defined before. That happened within our first six months of, of just putting tools around patients. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, we're not sure, but it's a really good thing that the brain grows. And so now we're looking at, OK, what does that mean, and, and taking it to the next level. So all sorts of um, innovation have come around focusing on, hey, it's got to be something tangible that we can measure. That, because if you can define what it is as an outcome, then you can replicate it, right? So we, in the midst of you know, eight years ago and the Affordable Care Act, were probably crazy to be focusing on spending money to really f focus on outcomes as opposed to cost. But we believe in the end it's, it's going to be the winning bet. You know, I, it's something you hit on is really important is thinking about metrics. Because yeah. we have things out there. You know, H cap scores and press yep. scanning, things like that. But what we've, you know, in prototyping, you think about other kinds of metrics that are in real time and right. helping. I mean, I love this example of the, of the growth of the brain because we don't know what it means yet, but right. because it's tangible, it's so exciting. Yep. And it infuses a sense of what's possible, That's but right. also showing that there's progress in some way. No question. So, one of the things that comes up time and time again when we're designing in these contexts is how do we think about these metrics and how we redesign actually what those could be. Yep. Um, because if we go, if we're go, if we stay the course of what we have right now, it's not actually going to lead us to a place no. of, of real innovation. You know, and one of the things that we did, um, just to wrap up here, when we designed, when we designed our building, as we said to the architects, we want measurement in everything, everything, the floor, the ceiling. We want outlets everywhere. We want to be able to measure everything present and future because we don't know what the right metrics would be in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. But our measurement was another key tactical approach that we took and that through measurement obviously leads you to then findings that then can lead you to better outcomes. So it's exciting. We I think time? we're our Are time we is up time. Time. Okay. I think we got it right on time. <laughs> nice job. All right, nice job. <laughs> so I'm Jenny Joseph or JJ. Um, all right, show of hands. Have you ever been a patient before? Okay, good, me too. So I'm a midwife. And I've been in the field for 40 years, 10 of them in the United Kingdom, 30 of them in the USA. So that's me looking kind of cute. I started real early. <laughs> so I immigrated to the States, though, in 1989. And I've been a practitioner and a patient in both countries. You probably have a story of your own, of, or your close friend, or your family member, a story that even now might reduce you to tears, as you remember perhaps the sense of Helpless unease of fear, frustration, powerlessness, or maybe even shame. 
For women, many of our stories are related to pregnancy, to delivery, to postpartum, and gynecological experiences, and some of those stories never leave us. We all want the same thing in the end. We, if we happen to end up being a patient, right? We all want to be the center of the experience, to be respected, to be listened to, to be understood, and invited to share in the decision making. And when that is missing, people suffer. Patients suffer. Their loved ones suffer. Providers suffer. Health systems suffer. And if the patient isn't centered, as far as I'm concerned, everybody's suffering. Yeah. So as a midwife in practice in Central Florida, I'm part of women's stories on a daily basis. And I see the difference that providing unimpeded access to patient-centered midwifery model care can make on her, and in fact, on every person that comes through our doors. I see mostly marginalized women, uninsured or low income, and women of color who are often traumatized. And they tell stories of being re-traumatized, belittled, blamed, disrespected, or even turned away at medical offices, at the clinics or hospitals, simply due to being who they are or who they are perceived to be. This is America. I also see affluent women, educated women, with good insurance. You all know what that means, right? Okay, especially those women of color who've been equally unable to get answers to their questions or timely responses to their concerns. Perhaps they weren't turned away, but they're not feeling comfortable either. And they're certainly wishing that they were somewhere else. So why is it hard for us to consider access to quality healthcare as a human right? Why do we feel some of us deserve different treatment, different quality care? What is really centered if it's not the patient? Is it the provider? The practice? The hospital? The risk managers? The shareholders? Is it the system? So in my opinion, the system is broken. We spend the most money per capita on healthcare, yet something's not quite right. It seems that centering these specific ways of being perpetuate structural and historical inequities and biases which allow and sometimes even overlook the unequal care and practices which may maintain the business model and the corporate bottom line, but perhaps really just hurt people. Here's what you get when you don't provide patient-centered maternity care. The USA has the worst outcomes in the developed world for mothers, with a ranking of 57th in the world for infant mortality and 48th for maternal mortality. Put another way, our babies are dying. Straight to the point. Twice as many black babies, especially being born too soon, too small, too sick, to make it through a first year of life. This is America. Around 700 women are dying annually, and with three to four times as many black women dying due to pregnancy-related causes as white women. But worse yet, 50,000 or so near-miss occurrences happen every year, meaning mothers who nearly died or are who, who are so seriously ill or disabled due to pregnancy, birth or postpartum, that they have suffered through the experience of giving birth, giving life. Mothers who may or may not be sharing their stories. Because who do you tell? Who's listening? Dare I say it, who even cares? We do a poor job of supporting women in this country, especially postpartum, where within two days of giving birth, you're basically tossed out the door, take the baby, go. Perhaps you've got a scar on your belly. You've certainly got unanswered questions. You have no access to your provider, no true access. You might call them, you'll get the runaround. It's all about that six-week postpartum visit. Seriously, a pap smear at six weeks. That falls woefully short of providing patient-centered care. A new study just out this month, newly published, looking at mistreatment of women during childbirth and confirms what I hear from women all the time. Top four types, look at this. Being shouted at, scolded, 
refusing the request for help, violation of physical privacy, threatening to withhold treatment. This is the United States. So this is the first quantitative review. We've got no shortage of qualitative studies, right? But when we ask, women will tell us. I wonder why we won't listen. Here's what you get when you do center the patient. Centering the woman, the mother-baby dyad, we see mother-baby as one unit, a pair. Centering her partner, her family, and her supporters. All the people essential to her health, because at the end of the day, we all need people. And for those of us who don't have anyone, we, in our organization, in our clinics, we stand in that gap and facilitate connections to build those relationships. See those chunky babies? Look at the thighs, particularly look at the thighs. <laughs> So at Common Sense Childbirth, I developed a maternity medical home, which includes prenatal and postpartum clinics and a birth center with the intention that no one is turned away for care, no matter what, and that all women are centered and fully supported throughout their pregnancy and their birth experience. And that means we take on the onus ourselves. We take on the responsibility of situating the mom, working with her financially if needed, her insurance or her lack of insurance, her social and emotional and mental health needs, her fears and concerns, as well as her health care. Wraparound services, what I call prenatal care plus. And because we've got a shortage of providers, we start training early. That's Issa. She had to measure the belly every time she came. So we learned, just give up the tape measure. Here comes Issa. <laughs> so in 2007, we conducted our first study of 100 of our highest risk patients. We enrolled them prospectively, and we waited to see what happened. And voila, we were surprised. But we had no premature or low birth weight babies among the African American and Latina women, none. And compared to the county and the state percentage that same year, we had eliminated the racial disparity. Not just dropped a couple of points, but totally gone. And that year, the African American women were at a one in five risk of having a preterm birth in Florida. Not one. So these are some of the pictures of the women from our clinic. And these are just regular women. It's not airbrushed. They're not models. Just round the way, girls that were part of our clinics, wanting the full-term healthy baby that everybody wants. Here's what you get when families experience the benefit of being centered, respected, listened to, where they get to choose where and how they deliver their baby. And with who? When their dignity is left intact at the end of the encounter, every single time. These are people who sought and found solace in our model of care, who found that it suited them better, found that they could trust us, that they could truly relax and feel safe, found that they could carry their babies to term, remain in robust health, breastfeed, and enjoy empowered pregnancies and parenting, like everybody else. And here's what you get if you center, train, and support, and empower the staff to center the patient who in turn become fulfilled and empowered themselves in their work and in their ability to make a difference. These are some of our medical assistants. I have a community health worker amongst them. One of um, the women is heading on to nurse midwifery training as we speak. We love our work. And yes, sometimes it's crazy busy. We run around all day like chickens, but that's because we see a lot of patients in a short amount of time because we have to pack them in because there's a waiting list for our services but we have time for everybody, we make time for everybody, and we feel good about it. So at Common Sense Childbirth, we use my codified midwifery model of care called the JJ Way at all our clinics to offer access, connections, knowledge, and empowerment to every patient, every time, and to the staff as well who provide their care. We run clinics in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Mothers choose where they deliver, 
They want a hospital birth, no problem. They want a birth center birth, great. You want a water birth, let's go. They get to choose and they have unrestricted access to the staff and to the continuity of their care wherever they deliver. Mums going through our programs have more agency, more power. They can fend for themselves. We teach their partners and family members to become advocates. We teach them how to navigate the system. We teach them how to send to the mother as well and what to look for, what questions to ask whenever they are not under our direct care. It's like preparing them to go out into a war. It's a horrible situation, but it's our reality. They can identify the non-patient-centered care they know what that looks like, what it feels like. They can recognize bias and discrimination, conscious or unconscious, and they can call it out and protect themselves. This equity model mitigates the persistent poor outcomes and consistently results in less prematurity, less low birth weight, healthy weight, full term, breastfeeding babies, healthier moms, and less perinatal depression. This is patient-centered care. I'm sorry, let me just pop back here. Yeah. This equity model mitigates the persistent poor outcomes and consistently results in less prematurity, less low birth weight, healthy weight, full-term breastfeeding babies, healthier moms and less perinatal depression. What was your experience as a patient If it was a good experience, would you know how to guarantee that it would be the same again? If it wasn't, ask yourself why not. These are some women from the clinic. They're really an example of what's possible. These are women that are at risk and would normally not look like that, not normally have these outcomes. Why? Because of where they live and the access they don't have typically to patient-centered care. In my opinion, the quickest, cheapest, and most practical route to bring about change in our broken healthcare system is to provide unimpeded access to equitable, respectful, patient-centered care for all. Doing anything less is not only unconscionable, but in many cases, and for, too, for far too many people, it is absolutely lethal. Patient-centered care saves lives. Thank you. Because we've seen two very different but uh, stories that have a commonality, which is making systems better. Yeah. In one case, it was going from already very good to super good. Mm -hmm. And in the other case, it was going from a situation which was pretty grim to one which is exemplary. Uh, they also had a couple of other commonalities mm -hmm. that I, I noticed, which was changing culture, mm -hmm. a fundamental change of aspiration of the organization, and a uh, focus on the people who are delivering care. Mm. I think that is, is really important because you've got to respect everybody in the system. So let me say just a few words about uh, Access Health. Um, I've had a career in fundamental research. I've had a career in uh, pharmaceuticals and biotechnology. It's all been driven by a desire to do what I can in my life to improve human health. Over time, I came to realize that no matter what the wonderful devices, drugs, processes that we'd come up with to treat disease, the overwhelming impression in the world, as you travel around the world, is inequity. Inequity in our country, inequity around the world. And it isn't because we can't solve these problems. It's because we're not using the tools effectively. You heard some uh, stories about the United States, which are depressing and true. But if you go around the world, some of those stories are even worse. And they involve not hundreds of millions of people. They involve billions of people. So I decided that this phase of my career, I would try to take lessons that I've learned about how you can be effective in causing systematic change. And that is through a foundation to influence government and the private sector to do something better. But in order to do that, you have to do two things. You have to know what to do that's better. And you have to find the people 
that want to do something better. Because we don't want to be like the Boy Scouts that helped the woman across the street who never wanted to go. We want to help people who help, want to help themselves and to help their country. So the foundation that we created looks around the world for the best examples. Mm -hmm. We look in India, we look in Singapore, we look in China, we look in Northern Europe, and we look in the United States. The best example that I saw and have seen in the United States of a whole healthcare system, an academic healthcare system, that's transformed itself to one that was going broke and about to be shut down mm -hmm. to one that is one of the best in the country, and in fact, one of the best in the world, was NYU Langone. Mm -hmm. And I decided to study how they made that transition in detail. Uh, and that's how I came to that, with the hope that this wouldn't only be a descriptive study, it would be prescriptive for those in this country and anywhere that want to make a difference in patient outcome, that want to make a difference in teaching, and who want to make a difference in high quality biomedical research. Great, thanks. So what can we learn about the NYU Langone model? What, what did they do? What worked well? I think the first thing we mentioned, which is culture. Uh, they had a culture of um, they were relaxed, they had thought they were doing good, uh, they weren't aspirational. They were failing, they were about to go bankrupt, but they were still complacent. Despite some changes that were made, they made com remained complacent. Mm -hmm. What is most remarkable to me is with new leadership, the same people were able to transform themselves because they had a different culture. They were able to infuse in that institution a culture of excellence, a culture of striving, a culture that they should be world class, which, by the way, is the name of the book that I wrote about it. It's called World Class because that was their goal. And it was a simple goal. One of the reasons that it makes it possible is in the medical field, everybody in this room who's involved in medicine knows what I'm talking about. We want to make a difference. That's different from running other kinds of companies where most people are in those jobs to feed their family. It's very respectable, but they aren't there to make a difference to human life. In healthcare, no matter where we are, the people want to make a difference. And I think that whether you heard the story of the midwife or you heard the study of rehabilitation, they're waiting and wanting for the, the opportunities. That's the first thing. Yeah. Second thing is, is really structural. Modern technology has come to the point, whether it's diagnostics, whether it's treatment, surgery, many, many things where you don't have to go to the hospital, be treated. I'll just give you a personal example. Not long ago, I had a gallbladder operation. I was in, in the mo at 6 o'clock in the morning. I was out by noon. I was playing with my grandchildren by 3 o'clock with no pain medication. Oh. And a week later, I was in Egypt getting a teleconsultation. Did everything go OK? That is modern medicine today. 80% of the surgeries that this unit does are done outside of the hospital. And so hospital-centric care isn't where we should be headed. We should be headed toward outpatient care. We should be headed toward community care and home care. It's a demand of demographic change, and it's enabled by technology. And NYU Langone was one of the first to do that. Mm -hmm. However, you can't do that unless you have an absolutely superb information system. Now, everybody has heard about the promise of information systems for improving medicine, measuring outcomes, measuring costs, developing value-based medicine, understanding what's really going on. There's many, many words around it. But everybody in the system, almost everybody, will tell you what a pain in the ass a medical system is, an information system, how it interferes with a doctor-patient relationship, how it takes up mu too much time. Well, that's describing a bad information system. Mm. Okay? You can take these tools and you can make them work for you. You can make the work of the doctor easier. You can make the work of the whole system better. You can understand what's happening in the outpatient clinics. You can focus and get the data in real time that you need to improve quality and safety and make real time changes. You can make a system transparent vertically, which we all know about, but something people don't talk about is horizontal transparency allowing one doctor to see what other doctors do. Am I using the same amount of blood? Do I have the same infection rates? Do my patients stay in the hospital 
longer, and do they come back for redos? And if I really need to know, I can look at that patient's record. That makes an enormous difference because we want to do better. And you can take that entire system, and the other thing they do is treat everybody with respect. Mm. The guy who was a chair of the board of this medical unit created Home Depot that basically destroyed the competition because it gave better service. Not better materials. They didn't sell better nails. They were selling what other people sold. They focused on service. And they made sure everybody in the organization was on that floor with their red jacket. Mm. Right? Same idea. If you treat your janitor well, you treat the doorman well, you treat everybody with respect, and you don't have any prima donnas, no prima donna behavior mm. in your OR, for example, mm -hmm. then they will treat the patients with respect. Mm. And the patients will feel that. And the final thing is, is to really measure everything. We heard that from the rehabilitation. You measure everything. And you, that's what modern information technology allows you to do. And then you make sense of that and you take action based on that. You drive up your, your quality, you drive up your safety, you drive up the, the metrics for your patient satisfaction, and you drive up your outcomes. And you do so by measuring the value and the cost of everything. Value-based medicine is outcome divided by cost. So you are cost conscious. And let me tell you one story while I was doing this book. The guy who put this information system together was a third level guy to start with. And the CEO could, couldn't find the information. He said, I can find you the information. And he built an amazing information system. But he said, we focus on the cost. I learned as a kid in Iraq from my grandfather that when we were sent to the market, us five grandchildren, we had to go out and buy a certain amount of fruit for a certain amount of money. And we came back, and we were able to keep what we could save hmm. if the quality was right. And we learned, and I learned, by high quality at a good price. Hmm. You don't, you, it's easy to buy high quality at high price, but how do you buy high, high quality at low price? And that is another philosophy that has to get built into these systems. Yeah. Great. Yeah, in an interview that I read um, with you, you said uh, treating patients with the right medicine at the right time in the right way is cost effective. It usually means you don't have to repeat those steps. Okay. Can you talk about that? Well, I think a lot of people at this conference have been talking about uh, precision medicine. Uh, precision medicine is exactly that. And um, I uh, created the uh, actually first genomics company, but it was different from most genomics company. When I say gene, I want you to think about the word gene for a minute. Almost every one of you will think inheritance. That's not what I thought about. I thought about an instruction for a small anatomical part that differed from cell to cell, physiological condition to physiological condition, and disease to disease. And if we knew all of those genes and all of those parts, we could see what was going wrong in any tissue, and we could help diagnose not based on your inheritance, mm. but based on what you had. Mm. And that would be part of precision medicine. And that is the difference between personalized medicine, your inheritance, versus precision medicine, which is now coming out. And it's, it's a very broad field. One of the other things you heard at this conference is that we can now, not even knowing what you've got, predict pretty well how you can be treated. And the reason you can do that is you could take, let's say, I live in Manhattan, take lower Manhattan, all the patients that come in with a certain set of symptoms, and pretty accurately tell you what you've got. In fact, I've seen data that says you can get 95% accuracy with your antibiotic treatment without actually doing an antibiotic swab by knowing what the prevalence of that particular problem in this age group, in that demographic is from previous data. And that's the kind of thing that's happening now. It's lots of technology, and it's a lot of information being combined to do the right treatment for the right person at the right time. And I should have also added, in the right way. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And in healthcare systems that you've studied outside of the US, um, where there maybe hasn't been as much investment or um, access to technology, how are we able to see that, that the same practices of precision medicine are able to be done? Um, I wouldn't say, 
you know, I'm a big believer in the highest tech for the poorest people. Let me give you an example of that, the cell phone. There's nothing much higher tech than our cell phones. Mm -hmm. Yet that is now in the hands of something like 800 million Indians, okay? People who live in India, 800 million. And they are now using that for information. Mm -hmm. So I think that is an example of how high technology can be put. But let me give you another uh, story. A number of my books have been written on innovations that are made there that we could use here. Let me just give you one example. I've studied an ambulance system in India. One system, this is it's one not-for-profit group supported by the government, it's a public-private partnership, that delivers ambulance service to 800 million people and in 10 years has saved 3 million lives. It's free to the user. The actual cost for ambulance service is $16 per pickup. And it's got the highest tech possible. Mm. And one call center for 50 million people. If we did what they did, we would save 200 times our cost, according to a McKinsey study. We can learn from other people. Not only they can learn from us. Yeah. And so one of the things we do is we study best examples. And if a country would like to have a better ambulance service, like Sri Lanka did, they now can get very efficient ambulance services. Mm. So there are a lot of things that can be done. I'd say in common, I see great commonalities between the needs. Here in, or in most high income countries, there's a demographic shift. And we've got to start treating people at home, aging in place, even dying in place. It's a big shift from being treated in hospitals. But that's not so different from what we need to do in what India needs to do, what China needs to do, what Indonesia needs to do, is not focus on hospital care only, but make sure the care is distributed in outpatient clinics, in community care, and as far as possible, at home. And so those are commonalities which our technology allows us to do. Yeah. And I have to say, it's, it's a, an uphill struggle, because if you look at what China is doing for Africa, building big hospitals, you look at what China is doing for China, building 10,000 bed hospitals. What India is trying to do is build medical cities to concentrate. Outpatient care is more convenient for patients because it's where they are. It's safer because they're not with all these other sick people. And it's a lot less expensive. Yeah, but if you are running a, a hospital, and especially a for-profit hospital, let's say, what's your incentive for getting people out of your hospital and into these other centers that you might not own? That's a good question, and that's where government policy comes in, yeah. or payment policies. It could be insurance, but you can incentivize. For example, the reason that you see a lot of focus now in hospitals on value-based medicine and outcomes is because they are being rewarded and punished hmm. by CMS. And they all know in America that what's happening is their profit margins, if they're not careful, are going to shrink and evaporate. Mm. And the reason for that is that all of us are aging into Medicare. And the profit margin in Medicare is much smaller, if not zero, from the profit margin from uh, private health care. Yeah. And that's shifting. And the kind of care you're giving to people as they get older isn't hospital-based care anymore. And you are being fined if you make mistakes. If somebody falls in your hospital, if somebody has a central line infection, if somebody comes back from a surgery to get a redo, you get fined and you have to fix it up. So all of our medical systems, because of these external pressures, price pressures, those are things we have to really look at. We have to look at what the positive, mm -hmm. what the negatives are there. There are gonna be some negatives too. Yeah. Getting people out too early that we talked about, okay? Not focusing on what happens once they get home and where are they going when they go home. Mm -hmm. So there's some negatives to that as well. But it is a pressure that the whole system is under. And what I tell other countries, if they ask, is they should be, they, they don't think they can afford the kind of health care that they'd like to give their people. But that's because they're looking at the wrong model. Mm. They're not looking at distributed outpatient community home care. They're looking at hospital-based care. 
And I try to encourage them to think differently because they can get better results at a cost they can probably afford. Is there a country that you've seen that does have a really effective model of outpatient community and at-home care? You know, I would like to say the best, the best outcomes and the best models are France and Spain. Not Sweden, by the way, because Sweden doesn't do elder care very well. But those haven't fully transited to what makes those systems so good is they are totally equitable. No matter who you are in your country, they're equitable. And there are also countries that have a good safety net for their people because we've talked a lot about at this meeting about the social determinants of health. I'd like us to think about a couple of other determinants of health, legal determinants of health. Mm. Okay, there was a recently a great article, I think it was a New England Journal, on legal determinants of health, on financial determinants of health, which are also part of it. We heard a great session on housing determinants mm -hmm. of health. There are a lot of determinants of health that could go under that total umbrella of social. But I think that when you look at those countries, you see systems that are working as well as they can work. But even those systems are under stress because of demographic change. There are two kinds of demographic change, older populations and immigration. And they're having trouble maintaining the quality and excellence that they have. And they have to rethink some of their models as well. Mm, that's great. Thank you. I think we'll end there. Okay, Thank you so much, Bill. You're welcome. Now I'd like to invite back up to the stage uh, Dr. Joanne Smith, Ann Kim, and Jenny Joseph. So Bill, maybe as, um, as they uh, come back up here and join us. And get plugged in. And get plugged in, yeah, which takes a little time. Um, I, I mean, I'm so inspired by Jenny's model in the JJ way, and you've talked a lot about replicating effective models from one system to other geographies, whether it's other places in the US or, or internationally. What would your advice to Jenny be, or what would your recommendations be on how could we scale up the JJ way and see it really take place across this country and around the world? Well, I think the first thing is to do what you've done is make sure we know your story. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is to make you, make, have you make sure your story gets known, write a book. Exactly. Write it, do a film. Right, we do right? a lot of outreach, All of that. a lot of awareness yeah, raising, think, And then, yes. and in terms of other countries, uh, do the same. Make sure, you know, maybe we'll send somebody down to study what you do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, help other countries learn from, from what you've done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jenny, what could you use um, from, yes. from this community in terms of scaling up that model? All of the above. Yeah. I think at this point, what we're looking at is recognizing what are the components that make it different and make it work. Mm -hmm. One of the most important ones is that there is no barrier to care. And that's inside of a system where there are many barriers to care. So we've taken that piece right out of the way immediately. And that engenders so much trust and relief. Our front desk is usually where everybody's in just dissolving into tears on the hour every hour because the women are so thankful that someone will let them in. The staff are so empowered to be able to support the people who present for care. We don't turn anybody away, regardless of whether they've got money, insurance, the right card, documentation. The, that in and of itself seems to make the difference physiologically. How would something as simple as that create a cervix that will hold tight, and keep a baby in for 40 old weeks? You know, these things are what I'd like to get out. Like, are these simple, cost-effective, and in some cases, free, literally free interventions that could be done? Could we just go ahead and replicate that? So yeah, no, we don't have universal health care. We get it. But at the same time, how can we not implement access points for people who we know need the access, and in the lack of that access, are going to end up costing all of us, including themselves and their families, ridiculous amounts of money for the lack of that. Mm, great, thanks. And can you reflect a little bit about what you heard from uh, what Jenny or Bill shared and share, share with us something that you strongly agreed with or something that you disagreed with? Uh, as a designer, my proclivity is actually to, to be very optimistic. So <laughs> one, one thing that I am really, was, I'm really struck by, actually two things. One is when you're mentioning sort of the, the role of leadership and creating the conditions 
to allow, and I think enable exactly the behaviors that you're talking about, which is uh, the agency around that. One of the thing, in the work that we do, one of the things that we talk about is how do we actually design the permissions and pathways to do that? Because mm -hmm. it's one thing to understand, I have, I'm being told I have the agency to do this. It's a very different thing, especially in, in an environment like that, where you can say, very clearly create the structures for, and the pathways to say this, these are ways in which you can then go out and creatively address, address these issues. And the results are really stunning because you can design for things like, uh, one, one thing I'm really fascinated by are, are values like kindness. How do, you, how do you build a sense of purpose that's both shared and individual that actually is, has been shown to have physiological effects? Yes. Mm -hmm but will result, and, and don't cost anything, by the right. way, right? I mean, this is just the nature of being a good human mm -hmm. that actually has impact on, on, on outcomes. Yeah. Great, thanks. And Joanne, can you share with us something that you heard that you really agree with or disagree with? Yes, well, um, <clears throat> you encouraged us to say that something we didn't agree with. But yeah. what, you know, my observation, Bill, is, um, that while it, it sounds good to push everything into the outpatient community and home settings, what we're finding in actual practice is that's driven by cost. And so the burden of care is being placed on families without the capability to, to, to handle that care. So while we do have information systems that technically could aid in the process of managing patients in the home. And certainly there's been some good examples with diabetes management and hypertension, for sure. But that's just a little bit of what, what ultimately gets pushed into the home. And I have, I have significant concerns that, um, that, not, um, that not that it's necessarily ultimately a better idea to push care into the home, but that we are, we are doing it now just based on cost without resources for families to be able to handle that care. And so it's, it's, um, it's concerning to me. And, 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 um, and I think to the detriment of patient outcome, ultimately, and family outcome. The other thing is I wanted to say that you mentioned about Medicare um, is less profitable than other payer types. Well, actually what we're finding is Medicare is actually a good payer. Because what's happening, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna name some insurance company names here, but there are a couple of insurance companies who even refuse to meet the Medicare rate. And it's a travesty. And Medicare, as Bill was saying, is, doesn't pay a lot. Now, public aid doesn't pay, doesn't even pay what, what it costs you to provide the care. So those of us nonprofit take public aid patients and we hopefully do so through, with benef you know, benefactors. But Medicare does provide you with a prospective system of payment and then, if you will, overages based on patients who meet, you know, who, who have unexpected um, complexity of care. But what we're seeing is a trend by insurance companies saying, uh-uh, you know, we're gonna undercut Medicare by six, eight, ten percent, which is which is unsustainable. And or denying patient care altogether because they feel that there just isn't a good enough outcome. So they'd rather send a patient to a nursing home rather than expend money, uh, meaning the insurance company, expend money on hospitalization or outpatient care. So some of the trends I'm seeing are, are because when I've said this before, in the absence of real quality, real metrics that demonstrate tangibly, verifiably, that what we do in healthcare actually makes an impact and a difference on the patient for the purpose they come to see you. In the absence of that, cost is driving. And I'm, we are seeing some not so good evidence of that as a result. Bill, do you want to respond yeah, quickly? Yeah, I would say a couple of things to that. Um, first of all, when it comes to the uh, U.S. systems, in the particular study I did of NYU Langone, um, they put a tremendous emphasis on outcomes. And outcomes that are patient-centric, called patient-centric outcomes. So it has a lot to do with what the patient says afterwards. And also, they achieved the uh, number one status of quality and safety in the U.S. as uh, part of it. And it's also done in a way not only to control costs, but I think everything that they've done is actually focused on the patient. Let me give you a, an example you might not think is patient-focused. 
That is free medical tuition. Now, all of you may have heard there's one medical school in the US that offered free tuition, not only to their entering class, but to all students. And I have a lot of friends who are deans of medical school, and they said, what are they doing, trying to compete with us? The answer is absolutely not. They already have the best students you can get. They did that to encourage other people in other schools to do the same. And it's be beginning to make a difference. I have a friend who's now the dean of Harvard. He's tried to figure out how to do it at Harvard, too. And it's a headache for him, but now they're going to try to do it. The other thing they're hoping for is that the people who are becoming doctors, and more people can become doctors, is to become the kind of doctors that uh, they want to be, not the kind of doctors they have to be to pay off their debt. And finally, they want their doctors to realize that they have a responsibility to give back what they have been given by giving patients who are poor the kind of treatment, the very best kind of treatment that they deserve. And so it's that kind of philosophy, which is a very different approach, I think. Many of the issues you mentioned, of course, are true. People do push people out. And they do put them into situations which may not be as healthy as they should be. But in terms of a, a macro picture of shifting from hospital-centric to outpatient care and to community care, I think we have to go in that direction. And if you ask most older people where they want to have most of their care, they want to have it in their community or they want to have it in their home. They don't want to have it in a hospital. With support. Right. Yeah. yeah. Great. Just yeah, like something about equity, because I think we want to maybe keep in mind that we apply our equity lens to all of this. Then we are we're talking about patient-centered care, but are we talking about all patients? So sometimes I think it's easier and quicker to just go back to yourself. What do you want for you? How would you want your family member treated? How are these systems and ways of being setting us up to not be able to maybe get where we're trying to go without considering equity? Right? Because at the end of the day, policies, systems, all the, the, um, the services and the, the delivery of the care, if we are not taking into consideration that for some people quality isn't, well, there's a fountain, and isn't it cute? But rather, am I going to survive? That quality is a different quality if you look at it across more of a, 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 you know, a range of who is that patient and how are they being centered. Mm. So I just want to bring that point to the discussion. Great, thank you. All right, we have about 10 minutes left, um, so I'm going to take a few questions. I'm going to start off with uh, the first three hands that I saw, so one, two, three. We'll take those three, um, turn it over to the panel, and uh, then see if we can take another round. So if you can just introduce yourself and be as brief as possible with your questions so we can get to as many of them as possible. Uh, thank you. Chris Gates, New York City. Um, what I'm hearing in all of your cases is you've each produced transformations where you are, which you know, is indicative of some pretty agile thinking. Uh, I'd love to hear from all of you. Is there an area where you've completely changed your mind in the last 12 months? Like something where about a year ago you were certain it was one way, and now you see it's something completely differently. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Right. Lucia? I'll, I'll just say no. Oh wait, sorry, uh, we're gonna just take three questions uh, from the audience I'll, and then we'll go back, okay, just so okay. we can get a few. Go ahead, Carissa. Um, thanks, um, Carissa Catalani, I'm from IDEO San Francisco. Um, I, it, it, it's remarkable that I, I guess uh, Dr. Smith, you sort of said it from the beginning, you said, I don't want to design around patient experience, I want to design around to, to outcomes. And really, among you, you actually represent some very different philosophies in what, how to reimagine the patient experience. On one hand, Dr. Smith, you talk about outcome-based design, which sort of naturally leads to measurable outcomes, like, like those that you might see in a value-based care system, medical outcomes that can be measured. And Jenny Joseph, you really speak a lot about patient-centered design, um, more holistic outcomes, things would be difficult to measure, like you said, dignity, empowerment, trust, relationships, addressing equity. Um, how might these two philosophies actually send us in very different directions as we reimagine the patient experience? Mm, great, thanks. And one, there was, yeah, right in the center there. Great, thank you. Uh, Peter Angood, uh, CEO for the uh, <clears throat> American Association for Physician Leadership. 
Thank you all for your uh, comments and presentations. Leadership certainly drives culture, and culture then drives quality and outcomes. And uh, you've given us some fine examples of this. Uh, there, there are numerous uh, uncomfortable statistics, however, on the finances in this country and uh, as it relates to health care. And yet, uh, we're being pushed towards value-based care. And in one way, uh, value is quality over cost. Very simple. And yet, when you look at value or quality or cost, how would each of you sort of clarify the perspectives on what is value, what is quality, and what is cost? Thank you. Great, thanks. Adrian, let's start with you with the, that first question about something that you've changed your mind about. Um, so, I, so I haven't changed my mind. So uh, two, two years into this experiment, um, I think uh, what has what is, uh, demonstra been demonstrated to me is that the right model in healthcare is putting all the right people around the patient. So the researchers, the clinicians, the physicians, all those who take care of the patient, but the patient right around them because the patient will define what it is they need solved first. And in research, we, we spend a lot of time, the standard of care, the standard of research in this country at any great academic medical center is you have research towers and then you have clinical towers and then you have something called translational medicine, translational research. And what that is, is basically somebody from the research tower coming over and translating what hopefully will work in the medical tower and then they go back. And there's been a lot of activity in development and design development recently in the last 10 years about getting more collaboration in those research towers, having the cardiology researchers uh, experienced in neurology research and the genetics research. That's great. Nothing wrong with that. But it's still not around the patient. <laughs> and the patient will tell you, as Jenny described, the patient will give you the metrics and the outcomes that they desire. If you go in for if you go in for some cardiac valve replacement, you want your valve replaced fully and cleanly and without um, any sort of incidents. All right? Very simple example, but the patient will tell you. So if we what what I have learned in the last year is this experiment of getting smart technologists and smart researchers to now go into the clinical environment and be with patients is the future. Why are we not putting, we, we have a wet lab in our hospital. I don't know that there's another wet lab in any, any hospital in the United States. I'm sure there is somewhere, but I haven't taken the time to look. We have a wet lab where we study human subject tissue from our patients and to our patients. It's nice to study mice, but I don't really care if mice get better. Hmm. If we bring the wet lab right into the clinical environment, you'd be amazed at how quickly that speeds up the process of defining what will work for patients and ultimately getting metrics on better outcomes that then can be deployed into what real success is. So I'm more convinced than ever that the separation of science, except for the furry, hairy animals, which can't be in the hospital, from, from the patient is not the right thing. Jenny, can you um, address Carisia's question, which is, yes. how, how do you think your philosophy differs um, from, from Joanne's, let's say? Well, I'm looking for the outcome, too. I don't think it differs, mm -hmm. but I think the root is different, and it's very intangible. And so, it's, you know, can we make a, a decision, a political will or a moral will to never mind so we can get to the outcome? Like, if we are so stuck on it must match a certain way or be measured a certain way, we're not going to get very far. That research that I put up is brand new research, but it's really the first time in any way we've got quantitative research about how do you feel about stuff. And look what we get. Right? So I think that we look at the outcome, this, we want the same outcome. Everybody wants everybody to thrive and to do well. But we aren't going to get there if we keep going in the same direction. So we're looking at how do we provide access so that we can get the outcome. And along the way, the connections are more important. The community involvement, the centering of the patient, the family, the mother-baby dyad, seems to me, at least in my work, to get that outcome regardless. It's been 10 straight years that we have knocked it out of the park. We're not dropping it a couple points. We're not saying, well, we've got less prematurity by two points here. It's gone. The babies are fat. The thighs are chunky. The mother's bellies are out here. They're begging us, get this baby out of me. I'm done. That's the difference of applying these intangible, perhaps unmeasurable things and training staff to keep replicating, training leaders to say, let me start a community clinic and do the same thing. 
this is completely opposite to maybe what other um, medical you know, endeavors are going on, but I think we're getting to the same place, the outcome. Yeah, oh, I think yours is a beautiful example of the outcome because I'm gonna take it a step further. I'm in the business of caring for premature babies who have all sorts of problems. Because mm -hmm. we know prematurity of the brain causes cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. congenital and developmental disability, <coughs> cognitive disorders. And so if you stop prematurity, right. the likelihood that you plummet all of those diagnoses that I just talked about is huge, right? right? Because I see, I'm the, our, my organization is, ca is caring for those preemies whose brains are like tissue paper. Mm -hmm. And, and who are so expensive yes. to manage. The long-term costs alone for prematurity are um, outrageous. And they, we've also got to consider the, the incentive to no fill question. a NICU, right? Because you've got to put some widgets into yeah. the system. It's a system that is for corporate benefit. And so we have these other pieces to contend with. Who's actually pleased that I'm keeping the baby in the belly? I'm just going to ask because at the end of the day, people seem to have difficulty with the concept that if something's working, why don't we just get on and replicate it? We yeah. should replicate yeah. it. I have a couple yeah. of answers to uh, the questions. One was, uh, have I changed my mind? I certainly have learned a lot. Mm. Um, it's hard for adults to change their mind. So what I would say, I've learned a lot, and I've been surprised uh, by many of the things I've learned. There are many approaches, as you've heard, to getting what we all want, which is a higher quality, uh, medicine, one that's more accessible. And there are many really innovative ideas. And so as I look in other countries and I look throughout our, our country, I see really good examples uh, of that. And so I'd say that was the main thing. The second thing I'd say is um, talking about integration of research and medicine. I actually chose my first job at Harvard's Dana Farber Cancer Institute because they created an institute in 1976 to integrate cancer care with the leading edge of biomedical research. That's what they built it for. And uh, I used to go to grand rounds, or actually not grand rounds, to rounds, daily rounds, 6.30 in the morning, to learn what it is that the doctors needed to know. Mm. Um, and we do have many great institutions around the country. National Institutes of Health has doctors right in there with their uh, with the patients uh, on a daily basis. And I think that's, a, that's been a whole uh, focus of that. And I, I applaud you for, for doing and, and thinking of it through in a very innovative way, which is how you design a space yeah. so that happens more easily. Right. I think that's really innovative and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to have right. done. Great, thanks. All right, Anne, last word. Um, do you wanna share, share a story about something that you were wrong about? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I think in, in the last couple of years, as I look at the work that we've been doing, um, I actually want to tie it back to the question that Chrissy yeah, had. Yeah, go for it. Um, is that I actually, these are not incompatible, right? I actually find that in order to achieve on the outcome, the ways in which we're talking about essentially the channels for, I would call them channels for design, mm -hmm. um, like the language is really different. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the work that we're doing is recasting some of the problems and the, and the ways that we're addressing that. So just as an example, thinking about, we've done some work in the HIV uh, prevention space. So, so rather than looking at that as compliance, how do we actually switch it into a ritual of, of self-care and, and an act mm. of agency and empowerment? I think there's something around the ways in which the language and our perception of healthcare is changing and needs to, because yes. um, without that, I think we get stuck in really old ways of doing things and, and, and the old ways of thinking about it. And so, as I think about, as we chart the, the course forward around that, that's one, one area that I think we should really be thinking about, because as we create more proximity, as you've done, for instance, with the researchers and, and, and uh, with the doctors, that actually is gonna be, become all the more important. Great, thank you. Well, I think all of us have um, some field trips to make to visit NYU <laughs> Langone and Newton Wellesley Hospital and the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab and Common Sense Childbirth. Um, mm -hmm. So much to learn from these incredible models and from our great speakers today. So thank you all thank for you. joining us and thank you for being here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.